Hi, I'm Mitchell Walker, and when I'm not teaching people how to find hidden money, I'm out stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and sick of sitting at home? How about sitting at home learning 30-plus simple living tips that were shared recently by a money blogger? That changes everything, doesn't it? To weigh in with their best simple living tips, we welcome from the Afford Anything podcast, Paula Pant. And from this here podcast, it's Sir Bagheadedness himself, OG. And finally, say hello to the guy who gives a voice to doom and gloomers everywhere from LenPenzo.com, Leonardo DePenzo. <laughs> See what I did there? Plus, today we welcome what may be the granddaddy of all budgeting software. Join us in welcoming the founder of You Need a Budget, or YNAB for short, Jesse Meacham. Of course, we'll still have time to magnify Alina's money question. She wonders about her 11-year-old's budding entrepreneurial venture. Plus, there will still be time for my mind-bending trivia. And now, a guy who's really good at keeping it simple, stupid. Emphasis on that last part, am I right? Joe Saul Sihai. Hey, everybody. I think there's an insult baked in there, but I'm not sure where it is. Welcome to Friday, or fry yay as we say here in the basement. I am Joe Salsi. Hi, or did I already say that? Did I say I'm Joe Salsi? Hi, I don't know, but I did just now. And across the card table from me, I can't remember if I said my name. I can't remember if uh, what day it is, but I do remember that this gentleman is OG. Thanks for the introduction. You finally remembered who I am. <laughs> it's it's about time. It's only been what nine years. I'm like uh, that that uh, other guy. Oh hell, we'll just call that, him OG. <laughs> that'd be easier to remember. <laughs> it would be. What's up, dude? I am so right. ready, so, so ready for the weekend. How about you? Uh, is it not always the weekend? It is the weekend. Every day's a party here in the basement. And somebody who helps us bring the party every Friday, we say, as she's in the middle of putting the orange in her mouth from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. I was waiting for you to put it in before I called you, Paula, and you screwed that up. <laughs> I know the minute that I heard you transition, I was like, I better not take a bite of this orange. He's, <laughs> he's probably about to call on me next. I was yes, I'm sitting here eating an orange, drinking a cup of black tea, just enjoying a, uh, whatever the day of the week this is afternoon. Is that what they call it? Friday happy hour, black tea in quotes. <laughs> it is genuinely a cup of black tea. That's all I can say about it. It's English breakfast. I think, well, at least I guess I shouldn't be drinking in the afternoon, but hey. But, you know, it's afternoon. It's, outside the line. it's afternoon somewhere, Paula. It's afternoon exactly. somewhere. Exactly. It's probably afternoon in England. So, really, I'm following directions. You are covered. At, at least, OG, oh, she's not uh, drinking Texas tea. That would be bad. It's a different kind of tea. It's a whole yeah. different type of tea. Yes. But the good news is, for a while there, they, were, they would have paid Paula to drink Texas tea. Is Texas hey, tea they... an alcoholic beverage? <laughs> Is it like a Long Island iced tea? Does she not know what Texas tea is? I genuinely do not. Oh, know it's a nut tea. week. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And the gentleman <laughs> who's in Los Angeles, the guy who's probably sitting on top of a big reservoir of Texas tea or California tea in his bunker, it's Mr. Len Penzo or Leonard Penzo. Joe or Leonard Penzo. I will take either one. I am drinking a 25, uh, some tang from a 25 year old uh, <laughs> jar that's on the shelf here in the bunker. Delicious. The is the tang 25 years old? The astronauts. Or is the, or is the bucket 25 years old? <laughs> but the, the tang is 25 years old. Oh. And it's hmm. still delicious. Of course it is. It, it goes very well with the spam. Of course, spam's delicious too. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, how long do the we? The older the better. It ages well. How long do we wait, Lem, before we tell Paula what Texas tea is? That should be a homework assignment for her. <laughs> maybe at the end of this episode. Ooh, dun, dun, maybe. Dun. Let's give you a hint, Paula. You invest in Texas tea. Is you it oil? Nice yeah. job. Yeah. Good work. Pretty good. 
Yes. I, you know, my hint was when you said that Len was sitting on top of Texas tea and or California tea. <laughs> That's when I was like, this must be something underground. So it's not a drink. It, it is. Well, it could be, but it wouldn't be a good drink. It'd be a bad drink. <laughs> this yes. must be some form of underground liquid. Yes. Let's see. What underground liquids are popular in Texas? Uh, is that a trick question? No, no, no. The answer is oil. That's how I guessed it. <laughs> I know. We got a great uh, show today full of no trick questions, in fact. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our featured blogger post today comes to us from My Money Chronicles. And Jason, who writes over at My Money Chronicles, wrote this piece, 30 plus simple living tips. I, I think, oh, gee, the issue is you get to 30 and you're like, eh, close enough. So you just put a plus after it and it sounds great. He couldn't uh, finish counting. No, I mean, it's it's a waste of time. That's a simple living tip. Stop counting at 30. 30-ish. 30-ish. Yeah, 30-ish. <laughs> that, that's even better. Uh, Jason writes, life can get crazy as hell sometimes. Boy, there's nothing crazier than right now, is there? Nobody knew 2020 be like this. I like to keep it real and I can't lie. It's been weird as hell. I've had my ups and downs of this year. Took some time off in June to get my mind right. I've been going through some of my old posts and found this one. It was right on time. It featured 30 plus simple living tips. Hopefully you'll gain some insight from reading these tips. You know, the first tip on here, Paula, I, we were joking about Texas tea and tea in general earlier, but his very first top tip is drink more water. Does that uh, mm -hmm. figure into the Paula regime? Oh, absolutely. I'm a big fan of drinking water. At this one point, I decided I wanted to literally drink eight glasses of water per day, eight pint glasses. And I thought that in order to make myself do that, I should start by pouring all eight glasses in the morning. And then that way, over the course of the day, since I work from home anyway, I could pick up one and drink it. And, you know, over the span of the day, I could see what kind of progress I was making. It would be like a visual cue that could help trigger that habit, right? So one morning I pour eight glasses of water and a few hours later, I watch my cat just drinking out of like a series of them. <laughs> and you realized so, that might not have been the great strategy you thought it was. A uh, cat was happy. <laughs> the cat, cat, well, well, if the cat ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Oh, gee, you keep track of your water? I do actually. And I noticed the difference when, it's down 20 or 30 ounces day over day or something like that. It's a pretty noticeable thing. It's very difficult to get to 80 or 90 or 100 ounces a day. It's That's a lot of water. That is a, a whole bunch of water. That is a ton of water. But you do feel good when you have uh, more water. Allegedly. Yeah, that's what I've been told. Yeah. I've been told I feel better. Len Penzo. I feel better. Yeah, Len Penzo, you like uh, water, I've heard, with hops and barley in it. I'll take my water any way I can. One of the things I that still I have it still boggles the mind is is there anybody much younger than you and me, Joe, that has ever drank water out of the hose? Any of us? <laughs> Are we like the last people? Remember the day when that was used to drink water out of a hose? When that was safe? So, oh geez, raising his hand. I was gonna say my grandparents lived on a farm and they had they had wells that were in random spots in their yard and you would just turn it on and, you know, eventually water would come out of it and you just kind of stick your head underneath there. And I remember when my, uh, when my kids were younger, I was trying to show them that, you know, Hey, if you were just thirsty, you could just go, just have a drink or you just turn the thing on. And they just kind of looked at me like, like out of that dirty thing right there, <laughs> like it's just water, <laughs> you know, and now they won't drink it out of this tap. No, you know, it's got to be. You're right. Gotta be, That's it's right. It's got to be like, yep. you know, the dad, the filter's not working. Like what, what, what filter? The filter for the fridge. Well, to turn on the faucet. Oh, I don't want to drink tap water. Like, what do you think the water is that comes out of the fridge? It's also tap water, dummies. No, it's filtered. You know, it's funny, the number of comedians that have done this whole water thing, uh, uh, Len, Lewis Black has this uh, great comedy piece talking about what you're talking about with the hose, right? You used to be able to drink out, out of the hose. All of a sudden, that wasn't sanitary enough, to OG's point. And now, now that Coke and Pepsi are involved in selling water, you need to drink eight servings a day, and you should probably, you probably need to buy it from the store. I think most people do. I, you know, I'll be honest, when I was younger, I, you know, I had how come every time I'm on this show, I sound like I'm the guy sitting on the porch, you know, yelling at, 
yelling at people to get off my lawn. I don't mean to sound that way, but I mean, when we were young, when I was younger, I don't even remember bottled water. Was bottled, isn't bottled water a relatively new thing or has it always been around? I, I can't, I really can't remember anybody it's, it's buying new. bottled water. I mean, water. within the last it's new, 15 it? years. It's yeah, just the stupidest years. thing. It's the stupidest thing. Well, there was a commercial that I think Nestle did or, or somebody did where they're like all in like, um, you know, like King Arthur robes sitting around a big table. And they're like, what should we do, your majesty? And he goes, I know, let's sell them water. And they're like, ha, 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 ha. that'll never work. Gaffigan, I feel like, Len, you're always telling the old guy jokes. I'm always quoting comedians. Jim Gaffigan has a joke about that one. He's like, water, I'd never buy water. And then somebody at a party hands you water and you go, oh, oh, this is really watery water. This, this water is you know, the way water you used to buy. It, I mean, there was water you used to buy in the old days, but you actually got something for it. It was like Perrier, right? But that's carbonated. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. That came from the from the carbonated springs of France, you know, and it was it, the it carbonated happened. springs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure there weren't carbonated is, springs in France. But. Oh, I thought this, I, I thought it was naturally. Didn't they say it's naturally carbonated? It says it's naturally. Yeah, carbonated. yeah, it's naturally. But I, I think he just means like a. Natural bubble is not called carbonation. As in, as in CO2 is found in the nature, so therefore putting it into your water is natural. <laughs> That's, I'm not sure. I don't know. I honestly, Maybe it does come out of the ground bubbly. I thought it did come out of uh, ground carbonated. No, I thought it was Mr. Perrier shaking every case. It's like champagne. <laughs> yeah. It's just like champagne. If you use the right grapes in France, it just it's just bubbly. It's like bubbly grapes. May or, them up. may or may not be true. Heard it here first on the Stacking Benjamin show. <laughs> and if it I'm turns out that it turns out it's not true, you heard it on a Ford anything. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up on this list, we're never going to get through 30 of these. Next up on this list is exercise more. Paula, back to you. Man, when I started exercising more, I got sharp. Yeah? Like sharp edges, sharp corners? Well, not not so much, but my brain function was definitely better. Until about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I had to start working on my metabolism habit, the way I ate, because uh, I got a case of the sleepies. But man, in the morning, I could rock. Nice. Yeah, I definitely notice uh, an improvement with my mood when I work out, especially cardio. Um, if I have some decent cardio sessions, they don't even have to be that intense, but just, you know, moderate, to high moderate cardio, something that gets you sweating a little bit, it makes a big difference. It makes like a big mood elevation but how do you make sure you get it done because you know there are days when i'm eh. so one thing that i've uh i've started doing recently is i tell myself that every day i need to either work out or walk ten thousand steps and so on the days that you know i don't want to work out i at least know that i'm getting some movement yeah uh len do you go to the old people stretching classes no, see, I'm fortunate in that I can work up a, you know, I can get a good cardio workout just walk into the refrigerator to get a, 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 a can, you know, some, some candy Another or something. Donut. So thank you, you know, I don't have to put a lot of time in. I, I, the heart rate gets going real fast, so. I love the good news there. I'm so out of shape that I can just totally, four minutes, I'm you exhausted. Guys, you guys are in good shape. You know, you have to work 40, 30, 40 minutes on a bike to get, you know, to get winded. You know, for me, it's, you know. Well, in all seriousness, how do you trick your self into exercising, Len? Seriously, it's get it over with, get up, get it over with. Uh, because if you sit there and think about it, uh, I, I tend to let it go. So yeah, it's always first thing to do it in the morning. And then the rest of the day you're done and you feel good and you've got the whole day ahead of you. I heard somebody say once, uh, trick your brain, get out there before your brain knows what the hell you're actually doing. And as you know, getting out there is the tough thing, right? Once you're exercising, I'm, I'm usually good. Oh, gee, uh, I found you when I was staying at your house. You're usually found yelling at your Peloton. I don't yell at it. It yells at me. Pedal faster. I think I can't. Please, please stop. Please, please stop the music. Please. Exercise is, uh, it's just one of those things that is about the worst thing imaginable from the time you start doing it until when you're done. And then even sometimes after you're like, that sucked. It was I'm tired now and I'm sweaty and I'm hot and now I want to take a nap, but apparently it's good for you. So you should do it. Get it done. It's like eating vegetables. <laughs> Same thing you do it first well, thing like in the morning. Pitch like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, Paula. Why doesn't <laughs> why doesn't pain and fast pain? Yeah, why, why doesn't Peloton use that? Peloton, it's like eating vegetables. <laughs> TM. Just get it over with. <laughs> Peloton. As good for you as flossing. <laughs> <laughs> Number three on here, take calculated risks. And I think this is important, Paula. You know, the younger the people, I mean, I think everybody needs to take calculated risks. But don't you think that sometimes, especially our younger listeners, think way too much about risk and not enough about opportunity? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean and I think people often especially when they're beginning, they, they go immediately to one of the two extremes. They either are reckless or they're overly cautious. I think being in the middle often comes with age and experience. But one thing uh, I read, the writer Morgan Housel, he wrote an article in which he described three characteristics of risk. He says there's the range of possible outcomes. There's the probability of any given outcome within that range. And then there's the risk of ruin, like your ability to withstand the worst of those outcomes. And so I like that description because it's a, a structured way to think about risk, a structured way to assess risk. I absolutely love that too. OG, when you think about risk versus reward, how do you think about that? Well, I think it's a little bit about who you are as a person. You know, obviously when you think about risk and return, you're thinking about your investment portfolio, but this could mean a lot of different things. It could mean changing careers. It could mean moving across the country and taking a new job. It could be, you know, lots of different things. And I often think that it's probably better to do it and then change course along the way. You know, one of our values that we're going through in our company right now is is kind of working through this. One of the things is decision making. Doing something is going to be exponentially better than doing nothing. You know, you take a look at the stock market and its ups and downs in the last couple of months. And there's some people on the sideline going, I don't know what to do. I think the market's going to go down or I think it's going to go up or I think I missed it or whatever. You can't just not do anything. You, you have to, there's eventually a decision you have to make. So create a strategy and do it. And really quite often the likelihood of like Paula said, the complete and utter financial ruin on a decision is probably pretty remote, all things considered. So, yeah. um, I'm a big fan of just throwing stuff against the wall and see what sticks personally. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Len, I'm going to go to you for the next one because you were joking earlier with the old guy jokes, but seriously, the next one he has on the list is enjoy the moment. And I don't know if you're like me, but I look back and I'm like, man, I should have done that more. And I definitely want to make sure I do that more in the future. Maybe less moments and enjoy them all more. Yeah, uh, that's really, and that becomes more important as you get older when you have fewer moments left. So, I mean, I'm only half joking there. Let's just say to the younger people out there, it goes fast and make the most of everything you got, right? You don't want to have any regrets going forward. You don't want to get to be in your 50s like I am or your 60s and, and, and look back and say, um, God, I wish I'd have done something else. Sometimes life is not perfect. Things don't always go great, but just make the most of what you got. I'm going to stick with you here, Len, because, you know, between your full-time career and the award-winning blog, you have had your share of haters, I'm sure. And Jason, Jason here says, ignore the haters. And I feel like, especially today, the more people are successful, the more there's a cadre of people looking to tear that person down, right? What do you do to ignore the haters? Because I know that, well, you know, I'll read 10 great reviews of anything that I do and it doesn't affect me that much. One negative review sends you spinning. Yeah, but you got to think, Joe, because uh, I mean, this is how I treat things. When it comes to reviews, for example, and we can use this for any kind of like Yelp or whatever, there's always, you can't please everybody. There's always going to be somebody who's going to be a hater. And so you just kind of have to take things a in a whole. You got to look at the whole, the whole picture. So if you've got, you know, a hundred reviews and there's three or four bad ones, you know, what does that say? Really? Right. It says that probably it's a good bet to, to uh, you know, the haters are just, they're they're outnumbered. I mean, the the good reviews speak for themselves. So, I, I mean, when it comes to haters, though, I mean, how do I handle them myself? I usually take them on, and I try to make humor out of it. So, I will, and I'll do this on my blog. I'll get derogatory comments or derogatory emails to me, and I will highlight them, and then I will try to make a joke out of it, usually, or you know, but I don't take them that seriously. 
So I, uh, you know, I don't let it bother me. You know what? It's just, that's just the way it is. I love how uh, Gertrude, by the way, made a stacking Benjamin shirt for us that I'm wearing right now. And on the back is a bunch of mediocre reviews, like a, b- a bunch of, <laughs> meh, I don't know that we got on iTunes. Paula, you're somebody else in the public eye and, and you'll appreciate this to back up what Len was talking about. Our friend, uh, Devin Carroll, social security intelligence uh, has just a great brand and big picture retirement. Devin once had somebody give him bad reviews on five of his different videos and he commented on the first four and on the fifth one, he just said, you know what? You've given me all this grief where you say that my brand sucks, but you watched five of my videos. I would say that makes you a fan. (laughs) That is a fantastic answer. Fantastic (laughs) answer. How do you deal with it? So it's funny you you asked me this because I just read my iTunes reviews today. And exactly as you said, I can read 10 fantastic reviews and then one negative one. And it's that one negative one that like sticks with me. Yeah. So don't let it, Paula. Yeah, Len, to what you said, you've got to kind of just take a step back and look at look at the numbers, you know, rather than focusing on the words so much, like look at the numbers. And if the, the number of people who are leaving you positive reviews greatly exceeds the number of people who are leaving you average or bad reviews, then that means that you're doing something right. You know, we call that Paula, I call that fly poop in the pepper, fly poop in the pepper. Don't worry about it. Right. Right. It's so small that you, you won't even, it's not even worth worrying about. By the way, the noise for people who can hear this uh, here in the basement, we're getting the remnants of the tropical storm here and it's hailing outside. So you, you may hear some some hail as we're as, as we're going either that or somebody's pelting stuff at us because this I was, was going to say it sounded like you're unwrapping gifts. eggs. That's right. <laughs> Speaking of haters. OG, OG, I'm going to skip the next one. I have an emergency fund because I swear we you know, we talk about that a lot. That's super important. But we know that's a good oh, idea. Really? The next, <laughs> the next one though, have a mechanic on standby. I don't know about for you, but wherever I've lived, man, developing the people I can call on speed dial to take care of the stuff, hugely important. Yeah. I don't think it's mechanic in the sense of like literally it's a mechanic, but you're right. It's, it's in the context of the Saturday afternoon, something goes wrong with the electrical panel and you got the guy. You don't have to call the big company that I'll come back on Wednesday and give you a quote and then maybe they can do it the following Thursday type of thing. I can give you a perfect example of this here with us recently. We had something, a uh, fan installed outside at our at our house, an outdoor fan. And I wanted to make it with a elect, you know, one of those Wemo switches that you can control with your phone. So yeah. I the switch, take the thing apart. It's changing a switch. Like how hard is that? Turn the power off, do the whole thing. And I look and it needs a certain number of wires and I don't have those number in there. Or I can't see them and, you know, whatever. It's already above my pay grade. So I put the thing back, flip the power back on. Apparently, I didn't put it back correctly. So here's this big spark. Smoke comes out of the box. And it's Saturday at 6 o'clock in the evening. And there's a party going on. And the lights are supposed to be on and the fan's supposed to be on. I'm like, this sucks. Of course, figures I would screw around with it and muck it up. I've got the card for this guy who's a master electrician in our area, call him up. He comes over, he charges me a handful of Doritos, a can of beer and 50 bucks and fixes it. And then installs the thing that I wanted installed. You know, I mean, just a very simple phone call. He was easy to deal with and, uh, and it made uh, Mrs. OG happy because she didn't even know that I screwed it up, which was a lifesaver for me. (laughs) Paul, it, it also reminds me of your time versus money argument. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can try to try to deal with stuff yourself, but A, you're going to be less efficient at it because you don't do it you know, regularly. You only do it as a one-off. And anytime that you're doing something, if you do something regularly, then you become more efficient at it over time. You know, therefore, if you don't do something regularly, then you're not as efficient at it as someone who does. So you are naturally going to spend more time doing it than someone who does that every day. And in addition to that, you also most likely have better things to do. I'm going to skip forward a a few of these. Uh, Never stop learning. If you're in college, enjoy it. The time moves way too fast. Don't worry about what people will think. If you're in your late 20s or early 30s and one day decide you want to rap, do everyone a favor and don't do it. That one's oddly specific. 
uh, set a budget. We've talked about here uh, a lot. Hard work really does pay off. I think we've talked a lot about that also. There are careers out there other than being an athlete or an entertainer. I'm not always a fan of the following statement. The grass is now as green on the other side. Actually, the grass is green wherever you water it. I found myself using that exact phrase a lot. I totally agree with that. But I want to talk about the next couple, Mr. Penzo. Uh, get your passport is his next one and travel in most cases, not as expensive as you think. I don't even care if you're not into travel. I've just found that when I travel and I meet new people from different areas, I find that, I don't know, I've become a little less judgy of other people's lifestyle. And I've kind of learned we're a little more alike than we initially thought. Well, very cool. I think that's great. So it's a it's a good experience for you. I think I think that's great. And and getting the passport, I think, is a, a great idea, too. You know, I'm not. I haven't left the country, unlike Paula, who I think leaves it, what, Paula? You probably leave the country every two weeks or something. On that <laughs> but I haven't left the country in probably 10 years, I'm thinking, is the last time I left it. And, but I got my passport, finally, last year. And for some reason, I have this – there's this freedom I have knowing that I have this passport now. Yeah. And I can go – if I want to go to France tomorrow or I want to go to Australia, or something, I can go. And it's kind of weird. It's like I didn't feel – before I had it, I didn't feel like I was confined. But now that I have the passport, I feel freer for some reason. It's kind of weird. Where's the first place you're going to go next? I want to go to Australia. I've, I've always wanted to go to Australia. That's, that's See, where I want to go. See, I want to go. I had a roommate from Australia, and I think Australia would be a lot of fun. I'd love to go to New Zealand. Uh, I want to go. Cool yeah. go, go. Isn't that a package deal? Don't you normally, if you go to Australia, you, you kind of make a side trip to, I mean, since you're there. Right? I find that go for to- a lot of Americans, they spend most of their time in Australia and not that much time. They kind of do New Zealand as a side trip. And I think I want to uh, spend a little more time in New Zealand, make it two different, yeah. maybe two different trips or stay for a longer you know period what else of time. Is cool? I saw Gordon Ramsay has a show on National Geographic. I don't know if you've seen that. I forget what it's called. He cooks in the native cuisines of places all around the world. He goes he goes and gets the ingredients of the wherever he's at. And he was down there in the island of Tasmania, and that looks quite spectacular. Actually. Did you see the one where he had to get the fire ants out of the nest in the tree or something like that? I, it was like a big hive of like – well, yes, I don't know. Yes, I, I just did. happened I to, that was like, had to shake the tree and like get it down and shake all the ants out of it and then muddle them and then he eat them. Had to get, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Paula, what's the so next country the- you're thinking about going to? Oh, geez. I mean, once the pandemic is over, um, you know, so last year I went to Croatia and Slovenia and I really like uh, that part of the world and I haven't explored it very much yet. So maybe Montenegro. Mm. Um, also, I want to go back to Nepal to see my family. I've got a, a niece who is now two or three years old who I still haven't met. So um, I need to go to Kathmandu to, to go shake hands with her. And I've also never been to Sub-Saharan Africa. So those are, I guess, my my next three spots. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Next up, there's no such thing as an overnight success. I think we could all talk about that one. Pay your debts. Uh, looking at the rest of these, uh, Paula, we'll stick with you. Which one would you say is your best of the rest? One of my favorites from further on this list is sometimes you have to be the bigger person, but not every time. And I say that because I have often gotten what I feel is bad advice from people who have said, you know, oh, just let it go. Let the other party get what they want. You know, if there's a dispute going on, like they they will essentially advise me to uh, to take the loss so that I can move forward. But that's not always the best plan. And if you do that, you run the risk of ruminating and regretting the fact that you never stood up for yourself and you never fought for what was rightfully yours. So sometimes you don't have to be the bigger person. In fact, sometimes the right thing to do is to stand your ground and and fight for what you believe is right. Len? I like surround yourself with positive people. I, nothing will kill a project faster than having somebody on it who's just a a Debbie Downer, a naysayer, or, or, you know, doesn't have the belief in a goal that you have and won't work with you towards that goal. So yeah, it's very important to always surround yourself with positive people. I had a recent discussion uh, this morning for an upcoming interview we're going to have with uh, behavioral economist uh, Dan Ariely, who, Paula, you've also talked to. Just a wonderful guy to talk to, but he talks a lot about friction and motivation 
but then I was asking him about one of his recent books that he wrote with a comedian and how did he pick a comedian? And he said, one of the great things in life and people listen to the show regularly are going to hear this later from him. But one of the great things is life is being able to work with people you like, Len, you know, being able to work with people you like and who motivate you and are uplifting that completely makes the friction in your life a lot less. Yeah. I mean, people will bring you, they can bring you down if you don't get, I mean, projects I've had at work. I mean, we've, you know, let people go off the program who, who, um, you know, go find something else to do because you're not helping. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can be so down that you just don't help. So yeah, very important to have everybody positive. I can't believe how hard the hail's coming down here. It is just beating on this window. Uh, OG, your favorite, you've got the last word, my friend. Oh, to what do I owe the honor? I think probably combining the watch less TV and read more. You know, there's just so much trash on television and such a such an utter time waste. I mean, between all the wonderful Stacking Benjamin shows that you should be listening to and the occasional Ford Anything show, <laughs> um, you should be very occupied with all of your entertainment. But um, it seems to me that... The whole reading thing seems to be kind of fading away. I don't know. It seems like the more people, more and more people I'm talking to are like, oh, no, I haven't read that. Oh, no, I didn't. You know, what are you talking about? What book is that? Who's that? Yeah. You know, and it's not like these esoteric, you know, random authors that we're discussing. So do yourself a favor and curl up with a book or listen to it on audiobook if that's your thing. But there's something about having that book and reading it and getting all of the different points of view about whatever the topic is. And that's how I do it. If I'm looking at one specific thing, try to find three or four different points of view on the same thing, the same event or the same subject matter, read three or four of them. You don't even have to read the whole book. Just read a little bit of it. And um, I think you'd be better off. Well, today I'm super excited because we're going to be talking about an app that many of you may have heard of, but you may not know the origin story. You Need a Budget or YNAB was created by Jesse Meekum. And today on the shortwave, Jesse's going to dive into the history of it. So if you're new to YNAB, buckle up because man, is this going to be fun. And for those of you that know YNAB, you're about to hear some of the history. Jesse Meekum, let's give him a call. And I'm my dad, Shortwave. It's our new friend, Jesse Meach. I'm a guy I've wanted to meet forever. How are you, man? I'm doing very well. It's nice to meet you. Well, I'm so happy that you're here with us. And especially when we're talking about budgeting right now, Jesse, because as you know, with people being locked away the past few months, a lot of belt tightening going on for some families with employment down. So I think this is an important time for a tough budget. But to get to why NAB and how it works, I want to talk about you for a minute. Okay. Why did you create YNAB? Did you see a spot in the marketplace that wasn't being served or was it a personal frustration? Was it something about your story? Tell me that. I wish I could tell you I saw some gap in the market because that would make me sound like I had some insight. But uh, I, I, you know, I looked at total available market and went for it, but that wasn't it at all. We, my wife and I got married when we were young. I was just turned 22. I think she was 21. And then we also decided to have a baby quickly after we got married. So I had I had about two and a half years of schooling left to wrap up an accounting degree. She had wrapped up a social work degree, but not, you know, you don't make a lot of money in the social work sphere. So we were just kind of living very tight. And I had built this little spreadsheet for Julie and me to work through our money, be aware of things. But then when our first was coming down the pipe, you know, that was where I realized if we wanted Julie to be able to stay home, which we we dearly did. And if I didn't want to have to borrow any money for school, which I did absolutely not want to do, then um, how could we come up with some other way to make money? And so I had this, you know, you're just egotistical enough to think you have a, an idea. And um, I did. And I thought, well, I'll just sell this little spreadsheet. And if we can make 350 bucks a month, we'll be able to finish school, no debt, 
I'll become a partner at accounting firm nine years later and we'll just, we'll be living the life, you know, and none of that was true except we were able to make 350 bucks a month. <laughs> and that was, that changed, it changed everything for us. So I, I still count myself so lucky that we didn't negotiate on borrowing money. We just said no. And we didn't negotiate on Julie being able to stay home. We went to a single income eyes wide open. We went to that single income and I'm glad that we didn't move on those two non-negotiables because out of that came an idea. And uh, I think too often we compromise on things that we don't want to do, like grabbing for a credit card or whatever it may be. You know, we easily walk past running out of money instead of coming up with ways to shore that up. And that was what happened to us. And I couldn't be more grateful that it did. It's amazing. It sounds like in the early days, it was a little bit of a tightrope then, Jesse. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, and people say, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. But I remember a month where we cleared 30 bucks, you know, with this little side gig. Like, you know, there were times where I thought, "Ah, should I shut it down? It's not that great. But uh, the spreadsheet lasted about a year and a half. And then we built some standalone desktop software, like old school dinosaur style license you put in. Uh, It worked just on Windows machines. Macs were just starting to make a resurgence a little bit. And so we uh, we retired the spreadsheet, came up with a Windows version. A few years later, we retired that version, came up with a multi-platform version. And then a few years after that, we uh, retired those and we have the web version, the phone, you know, the whole deal. You can ask Alexa how how much is in my grocery category and she'll tell you it's not enough probably. So <laughs> like we're, we're on lots of different platforms now and you couldn't launch now with a spreadsheet because everyone's on their phones and the, the landscape's changed. Sure. But I think the lesson there is is still germane in that we just needed a small bit to change our lives. We just needed to be able to make rent with that 350 bucks a month. And from there, the idea was good enough for us. And then you just you iterate over years. You know? It's well, and I, I'd imagine it's two things, right? And on one side, it's trying to stay competitive and relevant. And on the other side, you're thinking of features and making sure that you're impressing the people that have bought your spreadsheet in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we went and said, hey, all of you spreadsheet customers, we love you. But I mean, come on, let's get serious. This new software is going to be way better. You know, I'd spent a good bit of money on that new software, basically poured everything that YNAB was making right back into that. And within about a week, we'd made back the money I invested and then some. And so continually trying to stay ahead of that with the iPhone and Android, you know, when people say, oh, you roll this out and uh, then you just print money. That's not the case. Well, if you are printing money, you have to get having to give a lot back for just staying up to date. You know, when Apple comes in and does uh, some big OS deal, suddenly they're like, hey, here is six months of work. You know, you didn't realize that was coming. So it's real work, but it is it is very meaningful work to have customers write in and tell us uh, my marriage is better because of this, or we were able to move to a single income, or we've been able to cope with this pandemic as a result of this. You know, uh, that's very satisfying work, which I'm sure you can relate to as well. I got to tell you, it is it is amazing. As you may know, we talk to people that have companies that are much, much younger than YNAB, much smaller than YNAB in this same segment. And in those companies, I'm usually introducing people to uh, my friends to as an example. When I, I used to live in Texas, the whole town goes to the football game. My buddy Carter, who sits right next to me every week, he's like, what's on your Friday FinTech segment? And it's funny because he said to me one day, he's like, are you familiar with YNAB? I'm like, well, he, well yeah, I know YNAB. And he and, and by the way, it's not just Carter, Jesse. It's every person I know who uses your product. And this is not a paid endorsement. You're not paying me to say any of this stuff. I'm just, I'm just telling you, dude, every time somebody tells me about YNAB, I feel like they're telling me about CrossFit. I'm like, oh, crap, here comes the YNAB yeah, exactly. people. Because yeah. they, they just, it, Carter says, it's amazing. It's fantastic. It changed my life. But the acronym YNAB doesn't really roll off your tongue, right? No, it does. YNAB. Yeah. Where did you come up with the name, You Need a Budget? Was it just, I need a budget, so I'm going to call it You Need a Budget? That was basically it. Yeah, I was, this was back when you could buy a domain name and it wasn't already taken by somebody, you know? And, and so I, I looked over to Julie, my wife, and we were sitting there on probably, you know, some domain registrar. And I said, well, what should we name it? And, uh, she goes, what about you need a budget? And I said, okay. And that was that, you know, all that research and everything. We just, you know, when you have $62 dedicated to this new venture, you, you know, you can't pay a branding expert to figure this stuff out for you. So, I love we just it. just rolled with it. And sometimes I'm a little disappointed. I can't tell people that there was some great story behind it, but we're a friendly brand, right? We don't judge you if you come to us having made lots of decisions that you now feel guilty about. We don't judge you if you make a little or a lot of money. We don't judge you if you spend a lot or a little, only that you are intentional 
about what you do with your money and that you really are honest with yourself. This is what I care about. And I want my money to do those things. That's where we held. But there is a little bit of authoritarian playfulness around the phrase, you need a budget. Everybody does, whether they're making a lot or a little. And it's not about restraining. It's not about tightening the belt, even during rough times. It's really just about being intentional, strategic, aware, and just proactive. Like you spend all of this energy getting a raise, you know, fighting the politics of the office to get a better job, fighting for that new product launch project, whatever it is, like everyone just pours their soul into all this work. And then as soon as all of that effort is converted into this dollar, everyone's like, yeah, whatever. You know? Right. And you're like, whoa, why would you do that? Like, what the heck? You care so much about your whole life. And then they convert it over to a dollar and it's like, oh, I can't manage money. You're like, what are you talking about? The whole time managing your effort. The whole time I was a financial planner, Jesse, I always complained that people would make these incredibly rational decisions about money at work. And then they go home and make these completely emotional decisions. And when you look at which side of that equation is more important, if you're going to work hard to your point to make a dollar, take care of that money. Take care of it. Take, and and don't, it's not like save it and hoard it. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying if you love extravagant thing, then make sure you have money for it. And if you don't like, uh, I don't even like giving examples because it sounds like I'm judging. I used to say, well, if you love golf and then people are like, oh, Jesse thinks golf is a little, mm, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think anything, you know, I just want you to make sure whatever you care about, your money does that thing. And I feel like we're, we're the best in the business at teaching people a new way to think about that. You got to think ahead. You got to think about the future version of you. And I'm not talking about like compound interest rule of 72. Just like, are your car tires going to wear out? Yes, they will. If you know about car tires that don't, tell me. But we all behave like Christmas never comes, like property taxes never come, like car tires don't blow, like a transmission doesn't go. I don't know where that comes from. We just, we act like we can't think even a little bit ahead. And so all we try and do is teach people weigh your priorities and consider future priorities as you do that. See how things go. Let's walk through. We talked about people rave about it and they rave about it. My buddy Carter raves about it because he says it works. He's tried different budgets and why NAB works. Let's dig into the details, Jesse, on, on, on why it works. I believe this is called a zero sum budget, right? You're setting up Absolutely. and looking at the month ahead. So tell me exactly how why NAB works and why it works. So to go a little philosophical on you at the beginning, I talked about how Julie and I, we had these two non-negotiables. We didn't want to go into debt and we wanted to go to a single income situation and we ran out of money. So these three dynamics are all at play and running out of money was key to this. We actually try and get people, and this is what a zero-based budget does, it gets you to run out of money. Because when you put it to A, you can't put it to B, or you put part to A, you can't put all of it to B. And what happens is people start to have to weigh things, and it sounds simple, but when you sit with a finite amount of money and you say, okay, Joe, do we wanna go here or here? And you're like, well, there. That, that you just Your priorities just rose to the surface. And so we're always making trade-offs. So the first rule is to give every dollar a job And if you give it to one, you can't necessarily give it all to another. So we're doing those trade-offs. Rule one. Rule two, we call it embracing your true expenses. It means you look ahead to larger, less frequent expenses like the car tires, a medical bill that will eventually come, the roof's going to go out, HVAC doesn't last forever. Name your thing. You can just look back through your bank statement for the last year and find where it became four digits instead of three and be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That wasn't fun. You look at those and you say, okay, now considering future large, less frequent expenses, you bring that back to the present. You say, I want to spend $1,200 at Christmas. And I do that for easy math. So that's $100 a month for a Christmas bill. Now, when I have 80 bucks in my restaurant category, or let's say $80 overall, and and my friend says, do you want to go out to sushi, right? I'm like, oh, I don't know, because now I'm weighing Christmas against sushi. And we never, ever do that. And I love sushi and I love Christmas but we don't weigh them together. And so you're weighing future obligations and current wants, needs, desires all at the same time. That's where the power comes from. And where people go into debt is where they think, oh, that was a one-off tire blew out. Oh, that was a one-off Christmas, which is a scary thought. Oh, that was a one-off whatever. And it's not. Those are those little bits that just send you a little bit into debt, you know, death by a thousand cuts. So those are the first two rules. The third rule is super easy to talk about. Whenever you want to change your budget, you just do because you're, you're, you're talking about the football game. Imagine a coach that after the first snap didn't start making adjustments, right? I mean, you guys are sitting there watching under the Friday night lights. 
And it's like that coach would be fired the next day if he was like, no, no, I had my game plan. I'm not changing a thing. They work hard to make a plan. They do as much prep as they possibly can. They prep the boys. And then it's like, okay, as soon as we see how they're responding to us, we make changes. And you do that with budgeting as well. Our fourth rule is to age your money. We want you to get to a point, and you do this by following the first three rules, where a dollar you are spending now, you earned 30 to 60 days ago at least. Just breaking people out of that paycheck to paycheck cycle, which I'm sure you appreciate as a planner, you know, where you, they just, they're living right on the edge and you don't make good decisions when you're stressed. So that was like a two minute fire hose version of the four rules, but uh, they work and they work without our software. So I could sell it a little bit, but the if we can just teach people the rules, they can implement that with one of our competitors even. It's the thinking that's key and the software's slick and helps you implement it in a, you know, in this digital age. Well, the thing is, I think it, it encourages deci- not just decisions. You talk about decisions. I like talking about how it encourages discussions uh, because when you talk about Christmas versus sushi, I mean, there's a discussion there. If you're budgeting with somebody else, which one's more important to us? I mean, having these talk about philosophical discussions, is Christmas more important than sushi? It depends on the day, Jesse. It depends on the yeah, day. It does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> on December 15th, absolutely. June 1st, maybe not. You know, we just don't know. But what happens is you have these two people sharing finances. They're sharing a finite resource. They don't act like it's finite because they can swipe a card and walk past zero, but it's finite. They're sharing a finite resource. They don't talk about it. And all they're using for their information is how much of the resource is currently at this very moment available. The biggest liar in finance is the checking account balance. It lies and lies and lies. And it lies to both people and says different lies. To one, it says, and I'll I'll do stereotypical stuff. For one, it's like, you can buy these clothes. I'm talking about me and Julie. And for me, it's like, you can buy that new saw. Julie doesn't care about saw, and I frankly don't care about clothes. So it's lying to us. It's like, yeah, Julie, you can buy that. Yeah, Jesse, you can buy that. And it's not, it's not true at all. You take that pile of money, big or small, and that money is supposed to be set up into those discrete jobs, part of rule one. And so then Julie can look at there and say, can I buy some clothes? And hopefully it says, yes, you can. And do it without guilt, by the way. And it'll tell me, hey, Jesse, can you upgrade your wood shop and add another table saw? I would hope so at some point. And I can do that without guilt pure joy from a purchase and not from the dopamine hit that gets from clicking, but joy because you saved up for it. It won't derail your utility bill. I mean, Joe, I could go on and on and sure. on. You'd, you have to like, just hit stop on this. But <laughs> the, the idea, the idea of people sharing that information, but having those discussions, like you said, sure. it's killer. It's, oh, it's, it's the best magic. part. I always thought budget is number two. The discussion is number one. The discussion leads to a better budget yes. and putting the two together, I think is a, is a very powerful thing. I just have three questions left. Two of them are technical. The first one is, so is it for people that aren't familiar with YNAB, is it uh, software based? Do I download an app? How do I get to it? Yeah, you go to YNAB.com, take a workshop from us. We run about 150 a week. They're 25 minutes long. They don't waste 10 seconds of your time. So take a workshop, see how we think you th- should think about money, and then you know sign up wineapp.com or on your phone or whatever. We're all over the place. So that, that cool. part's the easy part. And, and I will link to that, guys, on the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Second thing is, how do you guys make money? What does YNAB cost? Yeah. So we teach for free. Everything we always do is free all over YouTube, my podcast, everywhere. Always teach for free. If we do our jobs right, people want to buy our software. And so far, that's worked. It's 84 bucks a year. I think monthly it's 12 bucks a month. So if you want to, if you're like, I don't know if I can commit to 84, but maybe run the 34 day free trial and then maybe spring for a month more, see if it's really, you know, really working for you. If not, then, you know, do the 84, it's seven bucks a month or whatever. So, you know, we're a, we're a B2C company. We're, we need to be affordable to people that are at the moment, you know, really hurting potentially. And, and so we don't want to be unapproachable as far as price goes. Last question I have before I do ask you about the podcast is, it seems to me, we've been a podcast now for getting close to nine years. It Ooh, seems to me- You're like for, an early adopter. It's, I don't know about that. Stop calling me grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to me from afar that you're, you've always been innovating, Jesse. You've always been somebody who, is, who the product has changed. What do you see as next for YNAB? Maybe for people that are listening that already use the product. 
Oh, man, this, you can get in such hot water when you start talking about like what, you know, dreams it's, and ambitions. It's just, it's just you, um, me, and two listeners, so don't worry about it. We're good. <laughs> okay, excellent. And one of them's your wife, so we're good. We're fine. We're totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I imagine a day where you're sitting across from your spouse, you're sharing finances, and you're looking at a, at a kitchen table, and you're both wearing these very lightweight, comfortable glasses that allow you an augmented reality situation. And instead of just talking through numbers on this 2D screen, you're sitting there with your, your spouse and you're like, well, what do you think about this money? And you make this money grow by, I don't know, grabbing it and pulling it up. So you just allocated more to Christmas. And then you're like, well, what if we did some more over vacation over here? And like vacation has like a little palm tree blowing in the wind, you know, and like you can just kind of not it's not tactile, but it's spatial. Yeah. And I wonder how it would look if you were in debt and there was a big hole in your table, like a hole. Like, you know, we talk about digging out of the hole of debt. Well, what if the table had a hole in it that was your debt and like you shoved money in and it fell and you waited for it to hear a clink like four seconds later? Or maybe the clink became a little closer because it was a shallow hole. So this is my mind. Like, like how how would it change our feelings, these emotions that we experience about money if we could experience them in some spatial way? If you can see so, it. Yeah, you'd see it. You yeah. could. I don't know. Like a Microsoft hollow lens kind of thing. Exactly. So I, you know, I have some thoughts around that, but it's, you know, you have to let the tech kind of do its thing. And we're never early adopters because we don't have enough capital to roll the, you know, roll 19 different dice. Right. But um, once we see that something's taken hold, uh, I like to get out there early ish. And uh, I think voice UI is another one that would be, that'll be interesting as the, as the UI becomes smarter telling you just what you need to know when you need to know it to make the best decision possible. We don't need to know our 401k balance when we're weighing whether or not to buy a new drill set, you know? Right. But man, it'd be nice if you walk into that big box store to have it immediately pop up because it recognized a geofence and said, Hey, you know, home repairs or tools or whatever, your category is $219. Or it, if Proactive. It, if it just popped up and said, you can't afford it to get the hell out of here. Yeah. It's like, turn around, <laughs> turn around. You know, what are you thinking? I say that. Right. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the, you need a budget podcast, man. Uh, what's yeah. coming up on the podcast. So I, uh, right now I'm going through like an atomic habits, but for budgeting idea, I was late to the James clear party with atomic habits and I love the book. So I've been kind of looking through behavior change specifically around budgeting, but a lot of the podcast is me unfiltered and I don't have to go through our editorial team. I just get to kind of say whatever I'm thinking that day. And it's a lot of kind of Jesse experimenting in his own situation. I, you know, all of 2019, I recorded every transaction manually. I didn't connect YNAB to the bank. I didn't do any of that fancy stuff. And it was a whole experiment about trying to be like more in touch with my money. And it was it was excellent. And I, you know, I ramble about gardening and chickens and fruit trees as well. So <laughs> you just don't know what you're going to get, but I keep it short, which is, it makes it more tolerable. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm looking at every episode's four to six minutes, uh, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Jesse, yeah. thanks for quality talk. degrades after that. So you know. <laughs> that's like after the first six minutes of this show, they're done. The next 55 <laughs> minutes, just horrible. Jesse, great to finally meet you, man. And uh, we'll link to YNAB. We'll also link to the podcast on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Thanks for hanging out with us a few minutes and talking YNAB. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know, all this talk of simplicity is fine, but I think I can do better. So today, I'm going to toss my hat in the ring and give you four of my proprietary tips, TM for simple living. First, don't complicate life by limiting yourself to one streaming option. Get them all. You need Netflix, you got Hulu and Disney Plus and HBO and HBO Max and YouTube TV and Tubi and all the other. This way, you can make a quick decision and always watch exactly what you're in the mood for. Costs must. You'll thank me later. Second, do you sometimes have a hard time deciding what you'll eat for breakfast? Give yourself some options by getting at least 20 kinds of cereal. That way you'll always have exactly what you're in the mood for. Honey bunches of oats? Yeah, like six days of week. That stuff is amazing. But sometimes you're in a Cocoa Puffs mood. Got to be ready for that too. Hey, before I break out my final two simple living trademark recommendations, here's today's trivia. On this date, the one and only J.K. Rowling was born. You probably recognize her as the author of the hit Harry Potter series. So now, today's question. 
How much have the Harry Potter books grossed? There is some gross stuff in there. I'll be back faster than you can Avada Kedavra somebody. I'm familiar with the Harry Potter series, but uh, Avra Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, or whatever Doug said, um, it might be a little bit uh, beyond me. But... We have an exciting, exciting contest going on for people that are new. We're playing a year-long competition, and in the game, as of today, well, I actually don't have the score in front of me, and so we're going to have to punt on what the score is uh, for today, but we won't punt on the order because I do know that uh, Paula had fallen a little bit behind, has been roaring back. OG is uh, tied for the lead, I believe, with Len. I think that's about where we're at-ish. So pretending I'm right, Paula, you get to decide first. Do you want to go first in the middle or last? I will guess first. First, that's interesting. Some confidence out of the gate from Paula. OG, how about you, in the middle or last? Um, um, middle, I guess. All right. We're being aggressive wow. here, Mr. Penzo. Wow. That means that you go last. So Paula, the books Did only. I actually stay first? Wow. That was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> I was thinking last. <laughs> but now the heat but lamps I I said first, and so the heat lamps are on. Word. Yeah. Are you a big <laughs> JK Rowling fan? I am a huge fan of Harry Potter. I read all of the books and saw all of the movies, but the books were much, much better. So, uh, yes, I'm a big fan of the Harry Potter series. It's one of the few pieces of pop culture that I very strongly know. Well, we're not going to let you, Ron Weasley, your way out of this one then. So what's the, uh, I didn't know if that makes sense, but uh, what does make sense is the question about how much money you think it was that she made on the books only. Okay, so... I know that she is a billionaire, and what I have heard is that most of the money that she earned came from merchandise deals that she has on the Harry Potter brand. So every time a, a t-shirt or a keychain or a hat gets sold, some revenue from that, I believe, is the bulk of the income that made her into a billionaire. So I'm going to guess that revenue from the books alone, excluding merchandising, is somewhere in the hundreds of millions. I'm just going to guess 500 million. $500 million. That's a nice start, but I don't think you can live on it, Paula. I know, right? Yeah, 500. That's, that's... I mean, after taxes, that's like, <laughs> you know, 250 million, maybe 300 million. Horrible. What do you do with that? No. Oh, gee, how about you, my friend? Uh, I've read uh, zero of the books, nor seen any of the movies. I think there's nine of them, 14. I'm not sure. Is there nine books and 14 movies? Well, I got to tell you, a lot of people say that the best part is the one where Voldemort says to Harry, Luke, I am your father. Yeah, that's what I thought. I've heard that, that that's the uh, popular thing. Um, okay. So I think there's, uh, so Paul said 500 million. It's definitely more than that. Um, I don't know. It, I don't know if she's a billionaire though. Uh, so if you make 50 million a book, a hundred million a book. I mean, that's how much your book deal was, right? <laughs> that's about half my book deal. Half your book deal. Okay. So I got the big uh, penguin okay. random house money. They're, they're, I'm going to say uh, 976 million, 976 million. Nine, almost a billion, just below. All right, Mr. Penzo, what are you thinking, man? Are you a fan of the Harry Potter series? No, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. The honeybee is, though. She's a big fan. Got the books. I think she's seen all the movies, but no, I, I am not at all. By the way, you know, you with your book deal, congratulations, by the way, Joe. Can you just take the advance and just run Skip Town? What would happen? That's well, I get both dollars they gave me and I'd probably get from <laughs> Stowe, Vermont down to the Ben and Jerry's uh, place down here in the corner. Uh, yeah. OK. Well, so uh, what did uh, OG say? Nine, nine hundred and seventy six million. Nine, then I'm going to say nine hundred and seventy seven million. But oh, oh, you gave him some breathing room. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. OG. All right. I'll give you some breathing. I'll give you more breathing room. One billion dollars. Oh, that gives him That's tons cool. of breathing room. Right. <laughs> <Just> to... <laughs> you want me to up it? I'll up it. You want me to up it? How about 
You want a lot of breathing room, OG? Six billion dollars. No. That escalated quickly. Are you kidding? You're really going to change it? Len? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let is changing so let it, it. be written, so let it be done. Wow, how about that's some confidence for a guy that has no clue. Well, let's, I think I owe OG because he's second, which makes no sense to me. He should have went last anyways, right? Oh. I, I can't I believe I accidentally said first. Yeah. I, I was going to say, you might owe Paula first and then OG. So, <laughs> But uh, we owe everybody an answer. But uh, you know what we're going to make f- you wait for it for just a minute. So in half an hour, I'm getting ready to interview a top author, somebody that you know, and you'll hear here later on the Stack and Benjamin show. During the course of my research, not only did I dig into uh, his current work so that we could go over that, but I also wanted to dig into some past work that was well known, but that I hadn't had time to read. So how do I do that in a hurry? Well, let me tell you about the most useful app on my phone and one of the ultimate life hacks, whether it's prepping for an interview like I am here or or if you're wondering if a book is going to really hit it for you and be worth your time, this app solves all those problems and more. I highly recommend it. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is super unique. It works on your phone, on your tablet, on your web browser. It takes the best key takeaways that need to know information from thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them down to just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. So I very quickly got this basic background. And frankly, I'm only going to ask him two questions about this particular piece. But what's cool about that is not only did I find some key information from the book, it made me realize that it's not going to be a waste of time reading the entire, entire book. And as you know, successful people like business leaders are well-known for reading lots of books. And Blinkist is known for busy people like you and I want to get to the main point of a book quickly so you can start using that information right away and you can use it as the top of the funnel to decide, are these just some quick ideas that I need to know? Or is this something I really want to spend a lot more time with? 12 million people are using Blinkist right now and it has a massive and growing library from self-help, business, health to history books has the latest titles from best-selling lists, as well as classic nonfiction titles that you always meant to read, but never had time to. Some of the books that you'll find in the personal finance area, Everyday Millionaires by Chris Hogan, Clever Girl Finance by Bola Sucumbi. You've heard both of them on Stacking Benjamins, as you have Nathan Laka. Nathan hasn't been on for a little while, though. How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital. I still just love that name of that book. Also, you've got uh, The Barefoot Investor by Scott Pape, and Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And of course, a book that I really, really need to dig into because everybody's loved it, uh, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for stackers. Head to Blinkist.com slash SB and you can try it free for seven days And get this, you're going to get 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash SB to start your free seven-day trial. And you're going to get 25% off because you're a stacker, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash SB. Paula, looks like at uh, half a billion dollars, you're the low person on the totem pole, and you're the one of the three people that knows what's going on. So you're clearly... (laughs) It's it's got to be five hundred million dollars. I mean, I don't know. So I, I I do know that she's a billionaire. I don't know how many billions she has, but I do know that the bulk of that is merchandising. So put all of that together, and I pick a random number out of thin air. <laughs> That's where the genius begins, right there. Uh, exactly. Oh, gee, you're at almost a billion dollars, and we thought you were strangled, but then Mr. Penzo decided to raise his bet. That's got to make you feel good. Uh, I think he's going to live to regret this one. And uh, Len, $6 billion, you decided, <laughs> Paula knows the series, she goes half a billion dollars, you go all the way up to six, as if, like, this podcast goes all the way up to 11. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, what's funny is it's almost like divine intervention. I just feel like, like this, that number just came, came out of the blue. Well, it's we preordained, I think. <laughs> oh, my, that is so, <laughs> wow, smack talk. Wow. Holy cow. Well, Doug, take it from here. Is it uh, divine intervention? 
Hey, all you simpletons. It's your favorite simpleton, Joe's mom's neighbor dog. Okay, wait a minute. Who wrote that? Back with your final two and probably most brilliant simple living tips. My third tip, we all know that pets make you happy, but they can be a lot of work. So if you want a dog, just get five of them. Instead, that way they entertain each other, decreasing your workload. And you'll still wind up being five times as happy for a fraction of the work. Win-win, or should I say arf-arf. And my fourth and final tip, the biggie, Go listen to an audiobook at 2x speed every night while you sleep. You're learning while you sleep. And the best part is, when I do this, I never even have to remember the books because the content just gets like, like implanted deeply into my subconscious. And then it just springs forth the moment that it's needed. Brilliant. How do you think I got this smart? Luckily, I haven't needed any of it yet. Apparently... But uh, I, I'm sure the second I do, it's just going to come like falling out. I just can't even stop all the, the knowledge coming out. Now that I've sufficiently wowed you, let's get you to today's trivia answer. The question was, how much have the Harry Potter books grossed? Would you believe that the books alone have raked in an astonishing 7.7 billion for the birthday girl, J.K. Rowling? And the movies have also, you know, they, they, they got a couple of bucks themselves. Uh, another 7.7B as well. Now that is one rich lady. On that note, I got to go reap the financial rewards of my trademarked simple living tips. See ya! Yo, gee, I gave you all that room, and I and it still didn't help. Me. I am frustrated with that answer. I feel I feel like there's a rounding error. Paula's got to be triply <laughs> frustrated looking at these two. <laughs> these man, two. I was, I had my decimal point in the wrong place. <laughs> I guess so, man. But even if you'd moved it one place, he still would have gotten you. Yeah, right. Right. Seriously, Len, are you like? Did you hear that from a burning bush? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if it's almost as if not that this would have happened that we recorded this a week ago and then we had to recreate it. Almost. Not that, almost. not that that would happen here. That would never happen. Are you not giving people a peek behind the curtain? I'm no, I would never do that. I would I was, not, you don't you wouldn't give anybody a peek at the burning bush ever. <laughs> I would I would never throw water cold water on Len's amazing display of just confidence. It's, it's more like the wizard. Was it obvious? <laughs> Dude, I love when you went from a billion up to six. <laughs> yeah, the high roller I am. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't just say, you know, I think it's 7.6. <laughs> oh, hell, let's go for it. 7.7. <laughs> yes, that's great. Hey, uh, let's take out the magnifying glass, guys, and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you're going to find those financial products used every day, nowhere near the best in class. In fact, it's interesting. I was just there looking at savings accounts the other day. So whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, credit cards, uh, where you can pay off your debt quicker through consolidation loans and cut up the cards, or if you pay your loans on time and uh, you can play the reward game, it's all at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Today, we're going to help Alina magnify her money. Say hi, Alina. Hi, Joe and OG. This is Alina. I have a question about my 11-year-old son. He has a pretty neat idea for a business venture. I'm not going to share exactly what the idea is because even though you only have two or three listeners, the maturity level of neighbor Doug is about on par with an 11-year-old. So just to be safe, I'm going to keep it to myself. So let's just say it's an interesting idea that's going to require some upfront cost that I'm willing to front him a little bit of money to split along with the money that he has saved up. I expect that it will yield him several hundred dollars in terms of sales and has the potential to grow further. 
And my question is, how do we get him started in the entrepreneurial venture? Both my husband and I work regular W-2 jobs, so we don't have any infrastructure already in place. So what's the best things to think about in terms of reporting his income, other logistics that we need to set up in order for him to get started? Now, in terms of the t-shirt, I wouldn't be seen outside of the house in it, but, you know, the stacking bedroom's t-shirt <laughs> could come in handy on the cleaning days inside the house. So why not go ahead and send me one? Thanks. Oh, she's killing us. Come on, Alina. They're awesome shirts outside the house. Everybody wants to see you in your stacking bedroom and swag. And maybe you'll happen across one of the other couple listeners. I mean, could happen. But congratulations to you for having an 11-year-old who's entrepreneurial and has a great idea. I think that's really cool. Let's start with you, Paula. What do you think about the 11-year-old's venture and getting him started? So I think that supporting an 11-year-old in an entrepreneurial venture is a great idea. I would not over-systematize it or over-engineer it from the beginning. I would test it, validate it. You know, I don't know what this idea is. I don't know if it's an in-person business versus an online business. So there might be some startup costs or other upfront expenses that are required to get it going. But I wouldn't, uh, I, I would just go move forward, set a budget of how much you're willing to spend for the upfront costs, get this thing off the ground. And if it succeeds, you can then figure out the rest of the structure, but don't over systematize it without actually testing this in the real world. Yeah. Len, when it comes to testing ideas, I'm sure that's what you guys do where, where you work and then bringing up a product to market and also keeping track of expenses and running a business. What advice do you have? Well, I'd like to congratulate Alina too, for having a child who's such a spirit, that entrepreneurial spirit, that is fantastic. I think don't sweat the big stuff in this case. I think, Fund what needs to be funded. I think the most important thing is teaching your son the whole process of running a business at this stage and making sure you know everything, keep track of everything that's required for a business, your expenses, the amount it takes to keep the business running, what the revenue is, teach him about the difference between a revenue and a profit. And like Paula said, I think then you worry about the real dirty details of it actually turning into a solid business later. But I think the, the real valuable lesson here at this stage of the game is just learning how to run a business and what it entails, that kind of effort. Oh, gee, do you think uh, that she should worry at all about the business entity? Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, like Paul and Len said, this is such a great thing to experiment with and let your kid just run with and just watch them see what they do, see what kind of help they need and resist the urge to get in the way. You know, it's a great opportunity to to work through the operations of a business and a great opportunity to, uh, frankly, it's a good opportunity to fail, you know, because if you're going to be successful or not, I'd rather my kid figure out how to, you know, not be successful and make changes at 11 than when he's 31, you know, and he's, and he's dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise or something like that. So it's just an overall great experience and a, and a wonderful thing. So I wouldn't worry about the nitpickiness of it, the taxes of it, the LLC stuff. We'll just see how it goes for the next couple of next couple of months. And then, um, and then decide if you need to really invest some time and energy into making it a formal thing. Some of the cool things my brother and I started a business when I was 16 and he was 14, my dad made us uh, write up a simple business plan, talk about what type of um, expenses we thought we'd have, how long it would be until we would actually make money. And it was funny, just the exercise of doing that made us a lot more um, confident and structured in our thinking. What's funny is in the in hindsight, all of our numbers were grossly inaccurate. They were just horrible. But I don't think that was anywhere near as important, Alina, as the exercise of starting to think like a business person. One thing we could have done better would have been to keep track of our expenses better. We did not keep track of our expenses at all like we should have. And if it does end up being being uh, profitable, I think having a good uh, finding a good accountant later on who works with small business people will be invaluable at that point. But I agree with all you guys. I think this is fantastic. It was great for us to start a business early and man at 11. Good stuff. 
That's going to do it for today. By the way, if you've got a call for our team here, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And you can be like Alina, even though she made fun of us, we're still sending her a t-shirt because we're the bigger person, Paula, in this case, we're, we're going to be the bigger person. <laughs> hey, and that's great. So long as you don't do it every time. That's, that's right. We will choose a different day. Not Alina. She sounds <laughs> awesome. So that's going to do it for today. Paula, it, uh, Sounds like your internet's going bye-bye, so we'll ask you first. What's going on at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have Pulitzer Prize winner Charles Duhigg, who is the <laughs> best-selling author. I, before I go on to tell you who Charles Duhigg is. Thanks, Joe. Behind the scenes, we're all, everyone's laughing at me because Len is constantly giving me guff about always saying like, oh, I've got a Pulitzer Prize winner on the show today. Oh, I've got a Nobel laureate on the show today, which actually I never have. Oh, you know, I've got some super impressive credentialed person on the show today. <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> here I go again, making Len follow that up. <laughs> but yes, on the Afford Anything podcast, we have Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and New York Times bestselling author, Charles Duhigg. He is an expert in forming habits and behavior change. He wrote The Power of Habit, which spent more than three years on the New York Times bestseller list. And he talks to us about how to ask better questions and how to understand the why so that you can better answer the how. I love, by the way, how Paula's internet got better right as soon as I called on her so that she could make sure she went before Len. <laughs> Mr. Penzo beat that, man. Oh, Paula, Paula, Paula. I can never follow you. I can <laughs> never do it. Okay. Well, you just say on your blog, you'll again. be linking to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should <laughs> Maybe I'll get more people coming to it. That'd be great. Um, on the limpenzo.com blog, we're linking to Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> Charles Duhigg. <laughs> By the way, forget going to Paula's podcast. We have a link to the book. <laughs> oh, well, I'll do my best here. This is really going to sound stupid now, but I have, you know, with the events that have been unfolding the past uh, month or two, I, I thought I'd, it would be apropos to write my own version of the anarchist cookbook for personal finances. So if you wanted to say throw a Molotov cocktail at your personal finances and how to blow them up, uh, I go over, uh, I don't know, quite a few cocktails on what not to do. So uh, step on by lenpenzo.com for the personal finance anarchist cookbook. Giving it to the financially irresponsible man. That's what Len's doing. That's right. If you don't want to learn anything, really. So, so that's after you're done. Your brain is tired from going over to Paula's and actually learning something. Then come over to, to my place. I think you'll learn a lot going to lenpenzo.com. Oh, gee, you and I have the weekend off, my friends. So what are you doing with all that time? Oh, uh, a whole bunch of nothing. Kids start school in the week, allegedly. We'll see. So, yeah, just hanging around. Isn't that Enjoying great? Me. That Those are my kind of weekends, man. Mm -hmm. My kind of weekends. All right, that's going to do it. Doug, you've got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Life is all about learning. Only fools choose not to learn. Learning helps you keep growing. It can also help you make more money, become healthier, and more. Second, take a lesson from our Friday FinTech session. You need a budget. But the big takeaway... According to Joe, you can't just say TM after something to trademark it. Uh, yeah, sure, Joe. You're such a joker. TM, by the way. How else am I supposed to trademark stuff? This guy. Thanks to Jesse Meacham from YNAB for joining us. You'll find more on You Need a Budget at YNAB.com. That's Y-N-A-B.com. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com and the Afford Anything podcast. Len Penzo appears courtesy of LenPenzo.com and ThePersistentItch.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. 
SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. the story about the going to Roy's uh, welcome to the after show this is the in part LA. of the show that doesn't exist okay so so Paul is eating the outside of an orange <laughs> so this will be funny I'll go first so I'm meeting a client at Roy's which is like an Asian fusion Hawaiian you know whatever type of uh, place and the guy says would you like any edamame for an appetizer I said sure so he brings out a plate of it like a huge plate my client's still not there and I'm you know, I'm eating and I'm hungry and eat more, eat more. And finally my client shows up and he says, uh, Hey, did you get anything to eat? And I said, Oh yeah, I had the uh, edamame. And he goes, did you eat it all? And I said, yeah, man, sorry. I was really hungry. He goes, no, did you eat it all? And I said, y yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah. He's like, he's like <laughs> did it taste okay? <laughs> I said, I said, I was a little stringy. Uh, you know, I've never had it before, but it was pretty good. <laughs> so, anyways, I would have totally to, done that. The first time I saw edamame, I, I, I just thought it's like a pea pod. You just eat the whole thing. <laughs> hey, by the way, uh, Paula. Speaking of foods that I don't know, the person that owns uh, the Airbnb where Mom's basement's located, you know, today said, "Hey, and if you want something out, you know, made some great recommendations of restaurants." But then said, hey, if you want something different, how about some Nepalese slash Himalayan food? It's in the town over. It's only open Monday through Friday. And when it's gone, it's gone. Like they just make enough. And then when it's gone, it's gone. Nice. Excellent. If it's the type of Nepalese food that trends toward more the Himalayan side of Nepal, I bet that their, their star dish is this thing called mama, spelled momo, M-O-M-O. And it is delicious. It's like this dumpling, uh, typically filled with meat. Like you can get a vegetarian version if you want to, but why? Is And it's like, it's, it, ah, I don't do it justice when I describe it as a steamed dumpling. It's so much more than that. It's a reason for living. It's like proof that the world is a good place. It's... It's it's everything that you've ever wanted in a food. It's never oversold. I was going to say, <laughs> yes. how the hell does it live up to that now? Now when I go, I'm going to be like, eh, two stars. It's kind of like a steamed dumpling. Yeah, with meat inside. <laughs> it's okay. No, but what I'm worried about, Paula, is is that, you know, it's going to turn out that you like don't eat the rind or something or the outside of the dumpling you don't eat. And I'm going to sit there in front of all of these people that know how to eat it like OG and uh, totally blow it on fork and that's right. You're supposed to use your fingers. Yeah. Blow it on my Himalayan adventure. <laughs> you know, I, I would doubt that Nepalese people eat stuff that uh, parts of the animal that Americans don't eat, like the, the gizzards of a chicken, like that, the neck gizzard part. Uh, we eat that. That's like, why would you throw that away? That's food. Fantastic. Why would you serve fish with the head off? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. It's an adventure. I'll take pictures and you can coach me. Perfect. Get the mama. She said as she finishes the outside of the orange. <laughs> <laughs>